Inflammatory bowel diseases. Inflammatory bowel diseases are diseases of the intestine which when benign can lead to a lot of morbidity to the patient and when malignant can lead to even mortality. So whenever we talk about inflammatory bowel diseases, there are two diseases that come to our mind. The first one is ulcerative colitis and the second one is Crohn's disease. So first moving on to ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is a disease of the rectum and colon with extra intestinal manifestations. Now, the first thing that I want to concentrate on is the fact that it is a disease involving the rectum because this differentiates it from Crohn's disease which does not involve the rectum. So, ulcerative colitis is a disease of the rectum and colon and it also has some extra intestinal manifestation that is manifestations outside the intestine. It affects the men and women equally in early life and most commonly diagnosed between the age of 20 to 40 years of age. So it is a disease usually seen in a younger age group. So what is the reason for any patient to develop ulcerative colitis? So westernized diet. So westernized diet, when we talk about westernized diet, we mean diet rich in red meat, less in vegetarian content, which has less fiber diet basically. So because of this, the patient will have defective mucin production because the goblet cells in the intestine are affected here. Also, it involves autoimmune factors because cytotoxic T lymphocytes act against the colonic epithelium and the presence of these anticolon antibodies are there which in turn affects the intestine and produces the manifestations of ulcerative colitis which we'll talk about. Genetic predisposition. So individuals with family history of ulcerative colitis are more prone to develop ulcerative colitis. Even psychological aspects like stress, lifestyle filled with stress, personality disorders, all this can lead to symptoms of ulcerative colitis. And one more important fact about ulcerative colitis that we have to remember is that smoking has a protective effect in ulcerative colitis, which is different from Crohn's where smoking has a deleterious effect on Crohn's disease. So if for this factor, for this reason, smoking, because smoking is protective towards ulcerative colitis, nicotine has also been used in studies as a therapeutic effect in ulcerative colitis. So what are the pathological features of an intestine affected by ulcerative colitis? So again, very important point, it starts in the rectum and extends proximally in continuity. So it starts from the rectum and then goes back to affect the descending colon, transverse colon, ascending colon, cecum. So it goes in that order and this inflammation that occurs because of ulcerative colitis is diffuse and uninterrupted. In Crohn's disease, we will read that it has areas of normal tissue in between affected segment. But in ulcerative colitis, it the, this inflammation is diffuse and uninterrupted. So it begins in the rectum, goes uninterruptedly to the left side of the colon if the left side of the colon is affected. If the transverse colon is affected, so it will be one single segment that is involved completely. And there will be pseudo polyposis. That is, there are false polyps that are seen in the mucosa of the intestine, which is nothing but the regeneration of the inflamed mucosa. Strictures are unusual. So strictures are more prone in uh, Crohn's disease, but here strictures are not seen. So gross appearance, it starts in the rectum, extend proximally to involve the other segments of the colon. The inflammation is diffuse and un uninterrupted. Pseudopolyps are seen and strictures are not seen. Under the microscope, 
inflammation of the mucosa and submucosa is seen so only the mucosa and submucosa is affected the other muscular layers are not affected in ulcerative colitis crypt abscesses are seen another important feature a microscopic feature of ulcerative colitis where collections of neutrophils fill and expand the lumina of the crypts of libercule so neutrophils go and fill the crypts of libercule leading to the formation of abscesses these are known as crypt abscesses the number of goblet cells in the crypts are diminished so because the number of goblet cells in the crypts are diminished the mucin production is affected inflammatory process in ulcerative colitis spares the muscular coat of the colon so only the mucosa and submucosa are affected the circular muscle layer and the longitudinal muscle layers are not affected and this is a differentiating feature from crohn's disease next we move on to the clinical feature so a patient presenting with ulcerative colitis since the inflammation is beginning from the rectum the patient will have history of passage of mucus and blood in stools so first it begins in the rectum then it goes on to become left sided colitis and causes severe total proctocolitis proctocolitis rectum and colon so watery diarrhea is present patient can have mucus and blood stain discharge per rectum colicky pain spasmodic pain because of the peristaltic segments of uh, the intestine it will cause cause the colicky pain and spasm patient will have decreased appetite and weight loss and relapses and remissions are very common patient will be treated for ulcerative colitis gets uh, healed for some time but again comes back with repeated symptoms based on the clinical features based on the number of stools passed the patient will be divided into mild moderate severe and fulminant so first one is mild so number of stools it is based on the number of stools that the patient passes per day and the other manifestation so mild less than four stools daily with or without bleeding so very simple your patient who comes with features of ulcerative colitis is categorized as mild if he passes less than four, four stools per day with or without bleeding no no other signs of toxicity a patient with ulcerative colitis comes with more than four stools daily few signs of systemic illness like anemia then he is categorized into moderate so here what happens is patient passes more than four uh, stools uh, per day may have blood in stools that will lead to anemia systemic illness severe more than six stools per day so here patient will have six bloody stools so there will be blood in stools because there is more than six blood uh, bloody stools patient will have systemic illness like fever tachycardia anemia and raised inflammatory markers and decreased albumin that is hypoalbuminemia and last one is fulminant here the patient will have more than 10 bowel movements systemic illness will be present and the colon might be hugely dilated leading to the formation of toxic mega colon where the diameter is more than 6 cm of the intestine so these are the colonic manifestation ulcerative colitis affects the colon and also has manifestations outside the colon what is called as the extra intestinal manifestation so what are those first one is patient will have along with the bloody stools along with the diarrhea along with any mere patient will have arthritis affecting the knees hips shoulders so arthritis ankylosing spondylitis more prevalent in patient with family history of ankylosing spondylitis erythema nodosum so here patient will have erythema redness nodosum nodules multiple skin nodules with uh, redness inflammation all over the body and then there will be pyoderma gangrenosum so pyoderma gangrenosum is a condition where the skin gets necrosed leading to the formation of ulcers and in in uh, ulcerative colitis these features of pyoderma gangrenosum are seen more in the pretibial region so the extra intestinal manifestations will be arthritis ankylosing spondylitis erythema nodosum and pyoderma 
gangrenosum. So how do you diagnose? You are suspecting that the patient has come with ulcerative colitis based on the symptoms, the extraintestinal manifestations. How do you diagnose it as a case of ulcerative colitis? So first one is patient will have diffuse confluent symmetrical disease from the dentate line proximally. So already extensively explained. So the mucosal appearance when a sigmoidoscopy or a proctoscope is put into the anal canal, there will be the normal vessel, loss of normal vessel pattern within the rectum secondary to the edema. Because of edema, there will be stretching of the uh, mucosa and submucosa of the rectum and the intestine. So the normal vessel pattern is lost. Frank ulceration, there can be multiple ulcers in the intestine and pseudopolyps. So ulcers with mucosa regenerating in between the ulcer leading to the formation of pseudo polyps. So features are similar, uh, features similar to those of ulcerative colitis in Crohn's, but in Crohn's the rectum is spared in 40% of the patient even in the presence of perianal disease. What it means is that in ulcerative colitis rectum is involved but there will not be any perianal fistula. On the other hand, in Crohn's disease, the rectum is not involved but will have perianal fistulas. Multiple mucosal biopsies every 10 centimeters are taken and stool samples sent for bacteria, ova and parasites. So once the sigmoidoscope is passed, the ulcers are seen, the loss of vascular pattern is seen, multiple biopsies are taken every 10 centimeters and then you have to grade the ulcerative colitis. It is graded based on if it, the mucosa appears normal, it is zero. Loss of vascular pattern because of edema will be grade one. Granular non friable mucosa. The mucosa appears granular, but it is non friable. That is, when you touch it, it doesn't bleed. When the scope touches the mucosa, it doesn't bleed. Then it is grade two. Friability on rubbing. That is, when the uh, the scope touches the mucosa, it starts bleeding, then it is grade 3. Spontaneous bleeding, you just pass the scope, you are visualizing the entire uh, rectum and co uh, colon, but you see continuous bleeding. Then it is grade 4 along with ulceration. This is the sigmoidoscopic grading. Next comes barium enema. So barium is given, the barium contrast is given per rectally. So here, what is seen commonly in ulcer ulcerative colitis is Toxic megacolon. Here the colon gets hugely distended. Diameter becomes more than 6 cm. There will be loss of the hostrations of the colon. So that is one of the features of ulcerative colitis. It is one of the emergencies in ulcerative colitis. Pipe stem colon. So this is what is called as the pipe stem descending colon here. Because the mucosa and the submucosa are affected, they are stretched. The descending colon loses uh, here it is the descending colon, it can involve any part of the colon. The descending colon has lost the hostrations, the hostrations which are otherwise present because of the tenia and that is called as pipe stem colon. The C-reactive protein will be elevated. So based on the sigmoidoscopy, it is divide, uh, divide, divided into early and late. Early proctitis, hyperemic mucosa, bleeds on touch, pus like exudate, later Tiny ulcers form, small, small ulcers initially form, which later join together. So this is the appearance of a ulcerative colitis. So this is normal epithelium. You can see the normal vascular pattern, nice shiny appearance of the mucosa, no narrowing of the mucosa, no pipe step appearance. On the other side, ulcerative colitis, the vascular pattern is lost, completely lost. The ulcers are seen multiple ulcers which are joined to one another. So these are the features of ulcerative colitis. So now one problem is that patient has ulcerative colitis, patient is having bleeding per rectum, has its own problem, watery diarrhea, patient is losing weight. The bigger problem is that there is a chance that ulcerative colitis might lead to malignancy. When will you suspect that a patient with ulcerative colitis is going in for malignancy. So first one is extent of involvement. If rectum only is involved, the chance of malignancy is less compared to the patient whose rectum 
and descending colon is involved. So that is more chances. Rectum and uh, descending colon is involved, more chances of malignancy. Compared to a patient in whom rectum descending colon transverse colon is involved, that patient has even more chances of malignancy. So more the extent of involvement, more the chances of malignancy. Duration of disease. So if today a patient is diagnosed to have ulcerative colitis, the chance of that patient developing carcinoma colon after 10 years is 1%. After 20 years from today, it becomes 15 to 20%. After 30 years from today, it becomes 20%. So longer the duration of exposure to ulcerative colitis, more chances of it turning malignant. Carcinoma in ulcerative colitis is commonly aggressive and poorly differentiated. So a patient in whom normally without ulcerative colitis develops carcinoma colon, compare that to a patient with ulcerative colitis who has developed um, carcinoma colon. So the carcinoma colon in the patient with ulcerative colitis will be more aggressive than a patient who has developed carcinoma colon without ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis with primary sclerosing cholangitis has even more risk of developing cancer. So the important point here is dysplasia. So more the dysplasia, more the chances of malignancy. It can be mild, moderate or marked. What are the complications? Okay, we know that the patient can go in for malignancy. What are the complications? So gastrointestinal, we already know there is regeneration of the inflamed mucosa, pseudopolyposis turning into malignancy, stricture formation, though compared to Crohn's disease, the chance of developing strictures in ulcerative colitis is less. Commonly in the rictosigmoid and anal canal, toxic megacolon in the transverse colon is a dreaded complication of ulcerative colitis because the colon gets hugely distended, can get perforated, will lead to peritonitis, it becomes an emergency. Massive hemorrhage. Patient is continuously passing bloody stools and there is massive hemorrhage. Patient has anemia and that can lead to complication and obviously perforation more in tune with toxic megacolon. Extra intestinal complications. So those were inter, uh, ulcerative colitis is affecting the intestine. Those were the complications of the intestine. What are the extra intestinal other than the intestine? Severe malnutrition. Patient is not able to take orally patient is having diarrhea, so patient will be malnourished. Liver cirrhosis, skin lesions, we already discussed, pyoderma, erythema, erythema, nodosum, arthritis, iritis, ankylosing spondylitis, these are all the extraintestinal manifestations, sclerosing cholangitis and carcinoma of the bile duct. So what is the treatment of ulcerative colitis? So the mainstay of treatment is Though all these are important, the first two are important. That is 5-aminosalicylic acid and corticosteroids. So 5-aminosalicylic acid, 5-ASA, it can be given either parietally or systemically. What it does is it inhibits the cyclooxygenase system. So this uh, cyclooxygenase system is responsible for the inflammation that occurs in ulcerative colitis. It inhibits it and produces its action. So 5-aminosalicylic, very important. Corticosteroids. So whenever patient comes in an acute condition, to give immediate relief, the first thing usually given is corticosteroid and that is a treatment for flare-ups. It reduces the immediate complications of ulcerative colitis. Along with these drugs, the other drugs that are given are immunosuppressive drugs and monoclonal antibodies. Immunosuppressive drugs like azathioprine az and cyclosporin and monoclonal antibodies like infliximab and adalimumab. So these are the two important classes of drugs that are used in the treatment of ulcerative colitis besides 5-aminosalicylic acid and corticosteroids. So now there is a newer drug called as Vedolizumab. So it blocks integrins used as a rescue therapy for severe colitis. When a patient comes with severe colitis, Vedolizumab is used. It is a monoclonal antibodies. It blocks integrins and uses it as a rescue therapy. So to try and avoid any emergency colectomy. 
So that is the treatment for ulcerative colitis for a patient who comes with mild symptoms, maybe three to four bloody stools and no other problems. But what if a patient comes with ulcerative colitis, which is severe? You are worried when a patient comes with severe symptom because that those symptoms can go on to become toxic megacolon, which can lead to perforation and cause emergency, which requires surgery. So to avoid that, you have to go to a different, different line of treatment. So when do you say a disease is severe, when ulcerative colitis is severe? More than six tools per day, patient comes with cramping pain, toxicity, fever, raised ESR and weight loss more than 10% and albumin less than 3.5 gram percent. So if the patient presents with these symptoms, then you say these symptoms, signs and investigation, then you say that the patient is having severe ulcerative colitis. You don't want the patient to go in for complications. Then how do you treat? So first line of treatment will be IV corticosteroids like hydrocortisone, prednisolone, 300 milligram per day per orally. So that is the first line of treatment. Then comes the 5 amino salicylic acid, which we already discussed, which can be over given orally or as an enema. Fluids have to be started since the patient is having severe symptoms, severe diarrhea, loss of blood, the patient will be dehydrated. So patient has to be admitted, fluid and electrolyte management has to be done. Patient may not be able to take orally at all for three to four days. And so to maintain nutrition, patient may even require TPN, total parenteral nutrition, proper monitoring of the vitals of the patient. And all this, if it is done properly, hopefully we can avoid an emergency surgery. But if the patient presents late and presents with features of peritonitis, that is perforation has occurred, patient has come with peritonitis, vitals are uh, deranged, the pulse rate is high, the BP is low, then there is no option but to go in for surgery. And the emergency surgery that is usually done is subtotal colectomy and end ileostomy. So subtotal colectomy is removal of the part of a colon which is involved, which is perforated maybe, resection of that part and then bring the ileum out at the right iliac fossa so that whatever the patient eats comes out through that, that is the ileostomy because once you resect the part of the colon in an abdomen which is infected because of fecal matter, the fecal matter has come into the peritoneal cavity. If you try to anastomose the two ends of the bowel, the two resected ends of the bowel, that anastomosis can give way in the post-operative period. That is why to avoid that complication, the part of the bowel that is involved is resected and an ileostomy is done so that whatever patient eats can come, can come out through the ileostomy. And when the patient is better, once the patient has been given adequate IV fluids, patient has taken enough orally, probably after a month or so, the re-anastomosis of the cut ends of the large intestine can be done. So the rectosigmoid stump is left long and can be either bought out as a mucous fistula or closed just below the skin. So one part of the intestine is resected, ileostomy is brought out, the distal part of the colon is there, so the part which is distal to the part resected, proximal is brought out as a stoma, distal can either be left long, can be brought out as a mucous fistula, so that fistula will be producing mucus or it can be closed. The advantage of bringing out a mucus fistula is the anastomosis later can be done without doing a complete laparotomy. That the advantages are it avoids a pelvic operation when the patient is unwell. You don't want to do an extensive surgery when the patient is not well, especially when the patient has perforated. Colonic histology can be assessed. So some part of the colon has been resected, sent to the histopathologist. Histopathologist will see it under the microscope and confirm it to be ulcerative colitis and restorative surgery can be done at a later date. Rectum should not be stapled off in the pelvis as that can get stuck to the other structures in the pelvis and later for the second surgery, it becomes very difficult to find that stapled rectum. 
and the advantage of mucus fistula is that it will not cause that mucus fistula, the distal part of the rectum can have a blowout because of mucus. It can lead to the formation of abscess. So instead of that, the mucus can keep coming out through the fistula. So that is about the emergency surgery when the patient has brought in a very bad condition. When will you plan an elective surgery for a patient with ulcerative colitis? So a patient who was put on medical therapy for ulcerative colitis, was started on 5 amino salicylic acid, was started on corticosteroids, was started on um, the other drugs that are required for ulcerative colitis, but has not responded. Instead, the patient has become dependent on steroids. Patient who is having growth retardation. Ulcerative colitis is seen in younger age group, usually in uh, around 20. So the patient is not taking orally patient will have growth retardation. So in those patients, you will plan a surgery, elective surgery. Extra intestinal diseases, the skin lesions, the pyo, uh, polyarthropathy, pyoderma, gangrenosum is so extensive that the patient cannot survive normally with the disease. Then um, a definitive surgery is required. And when that uh, part of the colon that is involved by ulcerative colitis is removed, even these diseases, the extra intestinal manifestations respond and the symptoms come down. And to avoid more malignant changes, obviously you don't want it to go and become malignant. So inside all these patients, you will plan an elective surgery. So what are the different surgeries done? The first surgery done, elective surgery can be the same surgery done for emergency. That is subtotal colectomy and ileostomy. The problem is here the patient will have an ileostomy. So the patient has to pass tools in a bag attached to the abdomen. Second one is protocolectomy and permanent endileostomy. Here the patient, the colon is involved, the rectum is involved. So the entire rectum and the colon is removed and the patient will have a permanent endileostomy. There is no question of uh, anastomosing the bowel, the distal end, proximal end, nothing is there. The entire colon along with the rectum is removed and the patient is having an endileostomy. Restora restorative proctocolectomy with ileoanal pouch. So here the rectum is removed, the colon, some part of the colon is removed and then an ileoanal pouch, the anal canal is attached to the ileum by making the ileum into a pouch so that in that pouch, fecal matter will accumulate for some time and the patient can pass tools. That is rather than directly patient continuously having the urge to pass tools, here a pouch is actually created where the patient will pass tools. And last option is subtotal colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis. So some part of the colon which is affected by the disease is removed and then the colon is anastomosed to the rectum. So by these surgical procedures, what comes to your mind is that the choice of surgical procedure depends on the extent of the intestine involved by ulcerative colitis. So segmental resection, small, small resection, anastomosis, different parts of the rectum and anal canal are not recommended. So in subtotal colectomy, like I said, what was done in emergency, the pro, it is usually done in a frail, frail patient, patient who cannot be weaned off steroids when there is doubt as to whether the colitis may be Crohn's disease. So in such cases, subcolectomy, uh, subtotal colectomy with ileostomy is done. So a pouch, a completion proctectomy or even ileorectal anastomosis can be thought of at a later date. Proctocolectomy and ileostomy. So here, like I said, the entire rectum and uh, intestine is involved, colon is involved. Nothing can be done. Everything has to be resected and a permanent ileostomy is done. So removes all the colon and rectum, permanent stoma, lower complication rate compl uh, com uh, compared to a pouch procedure. Pouch procedure has its own problem which I'll tell now. Restorative proctocolectomy with ileoanal pouch. Probably uh, one of the best looking surgeries for ulcerative colitis because you are removing the problematic part of the rectum, you are removing the problematic part of the colon, you are creating a pouch from the ileum and that pouch is anastomosed to the anal canal. So the patient is free of disease, 
plus the patient doesn't have a stoma. So pouch is made out of ileum as a substitute for the rectum and soon or stapled off to staple to the anal canal. It avoids a permanent stoma, which is one of the best things that you can give the patient. That is no stoma. Reserved for patients with adequate anal sphincter and Crohn's disease is ruled out. Very important to rule out Crohn's disease because then even the ileum can be involved in Crohn's disease. The types of pouches done from the ileum are J, S and W. So this is the J pouch. So you can see one loop of ileum has come. The other loop has come here. The two parts are anastomos and this becomes the pouch where the fecal matter will accumulate for some time and then that is anastomose to the anal canal. So this is the uh, J pouch, this is the S pouch and this is the W pouch. The basic uh, principle uh, idea is that in J pouch, the amount of fecal matter that accumulates is less. In S pouch, it is slightly more and W pouch, it is more. So the longer it remains there, the lesser times the patient has to go to the bathroom to pass tools. Colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis. Again, a surgery which looks very good for ulcerative colitis. Colectomy, part of the colon is removed. Here, the rectum at the time of surgery is disease free. So you, are, you can think of doing a uh, ilea, uh, anastomosing the ileum to the rectum. So the stoma is eliminated. Colectomy, colon is removed, ileum is anastomosed to the rectum. But remember one important point here, ulcerative colitis is a disease which can involve the rectum. So you are taking a chance by anastomosing the ileum to the rectum. So that rectum which you have anastomosed the ileum to can develop ulcerative colitis at a later date and then the whole anastomosis will go in for a toss. So perform if there is minimal rectal inflammation, avoid stoma. Since rectum is preserved, annual rectal inspection is advised so that the patient does not develop complications. Complications, pelvic infection. Rectum is involved. There can be accumulation of pus that can lead to abscess formation. Post-operative small bowel obstruction. So you are using the ileum to do pouch, um, pouch surgeries. So that can lead to small bowel obstruction. Increased frequency, urgency and fecal incontinence. If the pouch is smaller, or if there is no pouch like in ileorectal anastomosis where the ileum directly empties into the uh, rectum or anal canal, then there is increased frequency. Pouchitis. So that pouch, the J pouch, S pouch or W pouch that you have created can have inflammation and then when it gets inflamed it is called as pouchitis. When it gets inflamed it gets irritated and then it passes stools continuously like diarrhea. So that is called as pouchitis. So with this we will summarize ulcerative colitis as it is the inflammation involving the colon and rectum, 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 rectum is involved in ulcerative colitis associated with extra intestinal manifestations like arthritis, pyoderma, gangrenosum, erythema nodosa. Increased risk of colon cancer, longer the duration of exposure to ulcerative colitis, more the chances of developing um, carcinoma colon 10 years 1% 20 years 10 to 15% 30 years 20% medical treatment is by 5 amino salicylic acid corticosteroids immunosuppressive drugs and monoclonal antibodies and the surgical treatment can be emergency surgery and elective surgery emergency surgery is subtotal colectomy with ileostomy and besides that the other elective surgeries are proctocolectomy with permanent end ileostomy, restorative proctocolectomy with ileoanal pouch and subtotal colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis. So with that we have discussed in brief about ulcerative colitis.